Because of the way the brain works, you will always remember your very first roller coaster ride. Storing these new experiences is one of the brain's main jobs. In fact, your brain creates a mental blueprint of every new experience you have. A blueprint for any new touch is stored in one part of the brain. A blueprint for any new sound in a different part. And a blueprint for any new sight in still another part. But as powerful as that first roller coaster ride was, it can't compete with the lingering effects of your brain's earliest experiences. Although you have no conscious memory of this part of your childhood, it is these very first experiences that literally become the building blocks for your whole life. Unlike other organs, the brain is undeveloped at birth and it is waiting for experiences to shape how it will develop. The amazing thing about the human brain is that the younger you are, the more sponge-like your brain is which is the reason that children in three years can learn language, can learn to walk, can do all kinds of incredible things. But the very same biological sponginess that allows us to rapidly acquire language is also the same sponginess that makes young children more vulnerable to trauma than older children. Well, we have the opportunity to do police ride-alongs to a domestic violence situation, and so this was actually the first call I ever rode along. It was dinner time, and they were having spaghetti for dinner. It was dripping down the walls, the kitchen table was overturned, and we had three children in the household. Looking at this whole situation at the time, we said, uh, no evidence of physical harm, the kids are fine. We learned differently, of course. The boy in the corner it was classic behavior that we see with kids who have had chronic exposure to violence. He would just completely zone out, numb out, as things started to get scary. The six-year-old little girl on the chair blames herself for what's going on. But actually, it was four years later that we really appreciated uh, who had some of the most profound or severe harm coming out of this situation, and that was the six-month-old baby who was now four and a half and had seriously injured another child in preschool. It's literally the opposite of the way most people think about this. Most people think young children, they don't really understand what's going on and they're resilient, but the fact is if anybody's impacted more severely, it's the younger child. The brain is put together like building blocks in a sense. Those first blocks that go together are the more primitive area, the survival brain. The brain develops from the bottom to the top and from the inside out so that the normal development of the top part of the brain depends upon healthy development of lower parts of the brain. The top part of the brain, where you do all of your thinking, is the part of the brain that is most changeable, easiest to modify. But unfortunately, if a child has developmental experiences of threat and exposure to domestic violence, the lower parts of the brain will be impacted and they're harder to change as they get older. He was never physically abusive, but he was verbally abusive. Stupid. There was a lot you, of, lots and lots that? of screaming in front of the kids, berating, you know, putting me down, and they pretty much hurt it all. Children exposed to domestic violence, children who, who witness their parents fighting, literally are experiencing a state of fear. And when this happens, the systems in your brain that are involved in thinking at the top part of your brain are literally shut down. It changes the brains of these children. My son has seen and heard a lot of the violent outbursts. He was experiencing night terrors. And that was probably his way of dealing with it because in his waking state, he didn't know how to articulate at two and a half years old. So it was coming through you know, when he was asleep. When kids are chronically stressed, one of the problems that we see is uh, difficulty in attachment and bonding because they're so focused on survival it's hard for them to reach out and connect with others. My oldest boy went through a stage where he would bully his younger brother and seemingly laugh in glee. He was not remorseful or had no empathy that he could actually make someone cry. Many, many phone calls of, of him being disruptive in the classroom. He was a very bright kid, but that's when I knew that he was heading toward trouble. 
A lot of these kids get labeled as being, you know, bad, difficult, defiant. This is a very natural response to their circumstance. What the child is doing is a survival strategy for them, but it creates behaviors that are very difficult in the classroom. When they're in a crisis mode, they can't learn. The tragic reality of children growing up in domestic violence is that they end up with mental health problems at a rate higher than children who are actually the direct victims of physical abuse. My mother was a victim of domestic violence. Um, my father was an alcoholic, a drug user, and uh, just a cocktail for, for, bad, uh, for a bad living environment for children. My brother, he looked like he was crying on his way home. Me not knowing, I was just a careless little six-year-old, seeing him climb up to my mom's uh, medicine cabinet. I asked him what he was doing. And he, he boldly said, I'm, I'm killing myself. Eight-year-olds don't talk like that. The first person I, I got the call was my best friend's mom. By the time she came down to our apartment, he had uh, a butcher knife in his hand, just cutting himself um, all over his body. And I was just bawling, just crying. There was nothing I could do to help. My brother was, was crying. He didn't want to be there. He was trying to run out. But I had already known that the home, my home, wasn't my home. You know, it wasn't a place where I felt safe. Childhood exposure to violence uh, is about living in a, a threatening, scary environment that may escalate to physical violence, but it often doesn't have to. It's the, the chaos, the uncertainty, the fear of being in a home where things aren't okay. very interesting talking about the roller coaster because that's what we hear from adult survivors who are in violent households and also the children. The hard part for them, I think, is thinking about what is normal instead of this up and down life of uh, being in a violent, threatening relationship. Growing up in my home, there were six children. My mother and father, unfortunately, fought like cats and dogs. As a result of that, two of my brothers end up being batterers. I have two sisters. Even today, they date men that batter them. Exposure to violence is a lifetime legacy. We see that adults who have had negative childhood experiences often have coping behaviors that can be unhealthy. That certainly has huge effects on how one is going to parent. It's really important for parents to understand that their internal state, whether it's calm, or whether it's alert engagement, or whether it's frustration and anger, or whether it's sadness, depression, the baby absorbs these internal states. I have been in the moment with that sense of, of helplessness and hopelessness and stress and anxiety and rage. It really damages the brains of small children to be under a constant level of stress and anxiety. Every day I hope that I haven't damaged my kid in any way. They need to see from you as a parent how to deal with stressful situations in an appropriate manner. Being rational, not resorting to violence to deal with situations. Your children are gonna learn how to deal with stress from you. Luckily, my older son is verbal enough and is old enough now that we have conversations about how did it make you feel when that was going on? Was that scary for you? Yeah, and validating that. The biggest thing that helps children exposed to violence is to be able to talk about their feelings, get those critical messages. It's not your fault. Any conflict, I'm able now to stop before I add to it. I'm able to step away rather than trying to solve it at that moment in a state of heightened anger. Just try not to go through it alone. If you have a strong support system, and know what, what avenues you have available to you, you know, in case you do need to get out. I was glad that we got help when we did. One of the great things about brain science that we've learned is till the day you die, you have the ability to add new neurons in your brain, that the brain is more like skin uh, in the sense that it can rewire and heal itself in the most important area, the cortex. We have the capacity to heal and do better. The biggest thing we can do for kids exposed to violence is how many healthy adults can they connect to. I did a lot of my childhood in other people's homes, so um, I saw what positive relationships were about. I saw my friends were normal, you know, they didn't have the rage I had. Seeing 
parents that were together, that showed affection. Home dinners where everybody sat together, those are the things that I realized were important. And instead of being envious, I incorporated it into my life. I wanted to be a part of that. I know school is what made a difference for me. The teachers, the attention I got, letting me know that I could be somebody and I could do something. In fact, my oldest son, his teachers, you know, all six of them were very instrumental in coming forward and providing him support when he needed. They allowed him to be homeschooled to give him time to heal. The hardest part about being a parent now is trying to be different than how my parents raised me. Am I being a good father? What do I need to do to help you feel safe in your home? That's the part, the brain development part, that I think um, we want him to know what normal is for us. And normal is having people who support you and who love you and who want to take care of you. And that we want that to be his normal life. It's one of those pay me now or pay me later. And the truth is, children who are good at self-regulation, good at self-soothing, don't cry very much, and end up being, if you will, successful, are children who have had incredibly attentive early caregiving, which some people, unfortunately, think of as spoiling, it's exactly the opposite. Rather than spoiling the newborn, what you're doing is you are building in healthy self-regulation. So those are the things that I want to create an environment for my baby where he gets the benefit of, of what I've learned from all these experts and also other parents. And believe me, they're experts too. The most important thing that parents need to understand is that the brain of their child will become exactly what the child was exposed to. If you want your child to be kind, then you have to be kind to your child. If you want your child to be good at self-regulation and not lose their temper, you have to not lose your temper. And that's the beauty of the human brain. It is a mirror to the child's developmental experience.